To whom much is given, much will be required. Luke 12, verse 48. I memorized this one sentence Bible passage in Sunday school. It's actually the last half of Jesus' response to a rich man asking what he must do to get to heaven. As a child, I didn't understand what a rich man, a camel, and needle had to do with heaven, so I didn't pay much attention to that part. I did remember, and often still hear in my mind, to whom much is given, much will be required. At various times in my life, I've struggled with this story, especially the words given and required. As a child, I knew I'd been given a lot. I had people and things I loved a lot, a bike, even roller skates. My mom used to tell my sister and I that children were starving in other places of the world, so be grateful and eat our cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. I felt blessed and grateful inside. I trusted God's love and presence would always be there for me. That's a lot to receive. I struggled, though, with what God was going to require of me as a result. I felt like God gave me all this, and now I needed to give God something in return. It was like a payment or debt that I had to pay. But my actions, no matter how heartfelt, never seemed to be enough for all I'd received. How could I pay God back for the tree in my backyard that I'd climb and sing from until I felt happy again? Or for my third grade boyfriend, Willie, who stuck up for me against bullies? Or for my 11th grade friends who kept me from being beaten up after school? Or for a friend taking me in when I needed it the most? I felt like I was racking up quite a debt with God. I feared whatever was going to be required of me was huge. I just knew I would never be good enough or give enough or do enough to outgive God. It was as impossible as a camel threading a needle. As a child, theology can be confusing and contradictory, but so can life. For me, this passage in Luke remained unsolved until many years later. My husband Dick lost his job at age 55, and having signed a non-compete clause with his former employer, it was necessary for him to find a whole new profession. We lost our health care as a result, and I was self-employed. Dick decided to join me as a realtor. Less than a year later, housing prices plummeted. The stock market crashed, and we were forced to live off of what was left of our retirement savings. Like many others who lived through this time, we were shaken and scared. We'd only been married for five years, and we were completely thrown off balance. It was Community of Christ's tithing principles and spiritual disciplines that helped us find our way. Many times, Dick and I sat at our kitchen table and took stock of the money we had, the little coming in and the much that needed to go out. Sometimes we argued, and sometimes we cried. We often reminded each other that this was a temporary moment and that we just needed to make tough next steps together. We started selling things we didn't need. We paid fees for using retirement funds. Our two rentals were repossessed. Life was difficult. Sometimes our best choices were neither good nor easy. They were simply necessary, so we did the best we could. During this difficult time, we decided to renew a prayer practice we learned as children to thank God at the end of every day for all we had received. We practiced gratitude, and it changed everything. To be clear, it didn't change our situation. It changed how we approached our situation, and as a result, the choices we made. We faithfully committed to continue to give local and worldwide mission tithes, we agreed we would reevaluate our capacity every year and increase our contributions when able. This repeated practice, even through the hard times, 
and even now, has strengthened our bond with each other and deepened our commitment to God. I remembered during this time what I had effortlessly known as a little girl. There is no outgiving God. God's gifts to me and to each of us are endless. I remembered my childhood tree and all the ways nature and people and family and friends have blessed me. What I had yet to understand as a child was that in order for all that I have been given to be life healing blessings, I must receive these gifts first and understand that they remain God's. Instead, I was saying, thank you, God, now it's mine. When I operate under the illusion that I am the source or owner of all that I am and all that I have, I'm inclined to use life resources in a self-serving way. I even tend to pray for what increases my own comfort rather than for that which furthers God's purposes. But when I embrace the fact that I am to be a caregiver and steward, then I begin to understand my response to God's gifts is to generously distribute God's love and grace in every small moment and interaction through the resources I've been given. This is what is required of me. It is this stewardship response that Jesus was relaying to the wealthy man in Luke. It is what the good news of the gospel continues to declare to us today. Having wealth and possessions, no matter the type or amount, is not the end game. Believing we can be who God calls us to be without letting go of our self-serving desires, that is the camel trying to thread the needle. As community of Christ, we have been given everything required to step forward in our call. As individuals, we have been given all we need to live out Christ's mission. And we've been given each other. May we each commit to use all we receive, all that we are, everything we touch, think, do, and create. May we use our whole lives to pursue God's joyful mission of peace on and for the earth.